angle. Okay. So, sir, uh, we are live, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, shall we start the meeting? Sure. I think we can start the meeting. Yes, sir. Yes. Please. So, other speakers. Once we start the meeting, I will other speakers to share their screen. So, uh, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. It gives me immense pleasure to conduct the first webinar of uh, Indian Orthopedic Association Sports Medicine Subcommittee. And I am very much thankful to Dr. Uh, Uttarakhand Orthopedic Association and Indian Arthroscopy Society to collaborate uh, for this webinar. I am thankful to all the Executive Council of Indian Orthopedic Association, Indian Arthroscopy Society. And I am very much grateful to Dr. Ajay Pal Singh and Dr. Punit Agrawal for taking the initiation. So uh, we have uh, five interesting topics based on uh, PCL uh, reconstruction. So it, it is like uh, all about PCL. So in very briefly, I'll just introduce all the speakers. Dr. Naresh Gaud is an arthroscopy surgeon practicing in Bangalore Whitefields uh, Hospital. Dr. Anumapa Patil is a radiologist practicing in Pune, uh, specialized in musculoskeletal radiology at Star Imaging Center. Dr. Sibin Surendran, is a leading orthopedic and arthroscopy surgeon from the Calicut, Dr. Shripad Joshi, who is the professor at MGM Medical College, uh, Aurangabad, and Dr. Ashutosh Agrawal is our ex executive council member, uh, runs his own hospital in Varanasi. And we have uh, Dr. Uh, Ramesh Gaur, who is going to moderate this session along with all the panelists of, uh, from the Uttarakhand Orthopedic Association and other members also will be uh, from IOA and IAS will be joining very soon. So I'll hand over to Dr. Ramesh and Dr. Uh, uh, Puneet for the further proceedings. Over to uh, you, sir. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Sandeep. I would like to uh, thank uh, IAS Indian Arthroscopy Society on behalf of Uttarakhand Orthopedic Association for giving us this opportunity. We all know uh, PCL injuries, uh, how important they are uh, to any patient's uh, functional uh, well-being and how often some are, sometimes they are missed and uh, the treatment also is as compared to other ligament injuries. It's not, uh, it's a little bit uh, more complicated. So uh, uh, I think uh, it's a very important and a very pertinent topic which we are going to discuss uh, today. Uh, from Uttarakhand, sir, we have uh, the panelist, Dr. Navneet Badoni will join a little later. He is a professor of orthopedics at uh, SDRR Medical College, Dehradun. Dr. Atul Agrawal is professor of orthopedics at Himalayan Institute of Medical Sciences, Dehradun. Dr. Pradeep Meena from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Rishikesh. Dr. Tarun Solanki from Kashipur, he is a practicing senior orthopedic surgeon. Dr. Pavnish Lohan is uh, working with the uh, Doon Hospital, uh, Doon Medical College and Hospital in Dehradun. And Dr. Aditya Mogia is working with Subharti and he has his own uh, uh, clinic also. He's also, all of these, uh, all the panelists, they are uh, uh, practicing arthroscopy for quite some time. They're very experienced. And I think uh, uh, with this, probably we can start with the first lecture of the day. Uh, Dr. Naresh, sir, if you're uh, ready with your presentation, I think we can start the presentation with the first anatomy and biomechanics. Right. Thank you, sir. Marish, please start. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah, you you are audible and uh, very clearly audible and visible also. Thank you. And your screen is there. Right. Uh, first of all, uh, before starting, I would like to thank Indian Orthopedic Association Sports Cup Subcommittee. Indian Arthroscopy Society, Dr. Sandeep Birari, sir, and Uttarakhand Orthopedic Association for giving me this opportunity to present my talk on PCL anatomy and biomechanics. This talk is special to me as I am a uh, product of Himalayan, Artho Himalayan Institute, Dehradun. Uh, it, it gives me immense pleasure to speak in front of my gurus and mentors as panelists today. Coming to the talk, 
डॉक्टर नरेश प्लीज स्टार्ट स्लाइड शो यस यस आई हैव स्टार्टेड यस परफेक्ट PCL is being the largest intraarticular ligament it acts as a static stabilizer uh, it is a primary restraint for the posterior tibial translation also uh, it is a secondary restraint for varus valgus and external rotation out of all the total knee injuries PCL tears comprise of 38% of the total knee injuries of which if you see the isolated pcl tears are only 3% most of the pcl tears will be always associated with any associated ligament tears or any other concomitant pathologies the most common mechanism of injury being a posteriorly directed force from the anterior side of the tibia uh, as in, in this picture there is a direct blow to the anterior tibia while playing any sports like football or rugby or a hyperextension injury and dashboard injuries which is a common which can also cause other problems like knee dislocations other ligament tears femoral shaft fractures and hip dislocations as well and if it can also happen because of fall onto a flexed knee with foot in plantar flexion the gross anatomy of pcl uh, pcl is a intraarticular ligament which is extra synovial it starts Uh, on the anterolateral anterolateral aspect of the uh, medial femoral condyle it goes distally and laterally and inserts onto the inferior part of the posterior joint line on a depression between the two uh, eminences posterior tibial eminences uh, in a trapezoidal shape facet called known as pcl facet the end of the pcl facet is called the champagne glass drop off point the thickness of pcl average it will be around 32 to 38 uh, mm with uh, sorry length is 38 to 32 to 38 mm with thickness being 11 to 13 square mm if you see the shape of pcl the footprints will be fanned out uh, the footprints will be fanned out and uh, the footprints will be around 300 to 500 uh, percent bigger when you compare to the mid substance of the pcl it is composed of two distinct unseparable bundles which is the anterolateral bundle and the posteromedial bundle uh, anterolateral bundle is tight in flexion whereas posteromedial bundle is uh, tight in extent, uh, extension now we will be discussing about separately about the anterolateral and posteromedial bundle uh, basing on the attachments uh, coming to the femoral attachments anterolateral bundle makes up to 85% of the bulk of the pcl average length of the anterolateral bundle is 31.79 mm with a diameter of 6.5 mm square it it makes a footprint of 112 to 118 mm square so now the anterolateral bundle starts from the medial intercondylar ridge and extends up to the bifurcate ridge the bifurcate ridge is a, a small projection which separates both the bundles anteromedial as well as posterolateral bundle Uh, approximately there will be the trochlear notch and uh, distally uh, if anterior anterior menisco femoral ligament is present it will be there or else it will be the posteromedial bundle for making or marking the anterolateral bundle the points we will see are the trochlear point uh, i will I, sorry uh, you can see in this slide the trochlear point is the highest point of the uh, notch whereas the medial arch point Uh, is on the side they exactly at the 9 o'clock position so if you see the uh, attachment of anterolateral bundle it is 7.4 mm from the trochlear point 11 mm from the medial arch point and distal articular cartilage it is 7.9 mm uh, so be- behind the intercondylar ridge uh, it starts and uh, it ends at the bifurcate ridge it uh, may be around 55% of the t- uh, f- femoral footprint it will cover it is a major contributor of uh, pcl strength it the ultimate load to failure of the anterolateral bundle is 1120 plus or minus 362 newton this gave the concept of uh, single bundle pcl reconstruction as it is a major uh, contributor for the pcl strength the posteromedial bundle will be just behind the anterior lateral bundle behind the bifurcate ridge Uh, it will be in between the anterior menisco femoral and posterior menisco femoral lig- ligaments the length will be 32 mm and diameter 5.62 uh, 
uh, same mention in the points, the medial arch point, uh, it will be 11 mm. And from the posterior articular margin, it will be 10 mm. The ultimate load to failure strength is 419. Distally, uh, when the posterior medial uh, bundle and the anterolateral bundle both go together uh, laterally and uh, behind, uh, the anterior menisco femoral ligament also, it converges onto the posterior medial bundle. The tibial attachments, both the anterolateral bundle and posterior medial bundle attaches in between the two tibial eminences. Uh, the anterolateral bundle attaches on the anterior part of the PCL fossa, uh, which is a flat surface on the, uh, it is just behind the two mm behind the shiny white fibers of the medial meniscus. These shiny white fibers of medial meniscus are very important when you are drilling the tibial uh, guide pin. Because if you damage the shiny white fibers, the root tears can happen. Uh, and uh, it ends at the bundle ridge. The bundle ridge is the same like a bifurcate ridge, which is a projection which divides between the anterolateral bundle as well as the posterior medial bundle. So in this picture, arthroscopic picture, you can see uh, the through the posterior medial portal, we are trying to shave the uh, PCL uh, and uh, we can see the PCL facet oh, no. as well as... Excuse me. Am I audible? Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, Mr. Doctor. Yes, yes, Mr. Doctor. Some, some disturbance, sir. but you are audible now, yes. Okay, okay, sir. Okay. See, uh, the shiny white fibers, you can see here as a, in arrow mark, the shiny white fibers of the posterior medial, uh, sorry, posterior arm of medial meniscus is just... Uh, in front of the attachment of the anterolateral bundle. Now, whenever you are drilling a guide wire uh, with them, uh, there is a protection with a sleeve or protection with a curate. Uh, we have to see the shiny white fibers of the posterior arm of medial meniscus. Uh, it should not damage it. Uh, the posterior medial bundle covers the posterior surface of the slanting surface of the posterior uh, facet. And uh, the posterior fibers of the posterior medial bend, bundle blends with the fibers of the tibial periosteum. Uh, this is the same as I told you, uh, how to put a guide pin uh, in between the uh, anterolateral bundle and posterior medial bundle. Uh, from the champagne glass drop-off point, when you draw a straight line pair, uh, in the horizontal manner, manner and a vertical, a vertical will be drawn or to perpendicular to the uh, previous line, the drill guide or the guide pin should be in 45 degrees, which should exit just in 1 mm uh, proximal to the bifurcate ridge. The menisco femoral ligaments are attachments of the meniscus, lateral meniscus to the medial femoral condyle. Uh, they are named in relationship with the PCL. If it is in front, it is called uh, anterior menisco femoral ligament are also known as ligament of Humphrey. Uh, if it is in the back, uh, it is called posterior menisco femoral ligament or also called as ligament of uh, Risberg. They regulate the posterior arch of the lateral meniscus and prevents from impingement of the lateral meniscus. Uh, and it, they also reduces the anteroposterior instability by direct stabilizing effect. You can see the lateral meniscus, uh, at the end of the lateral meniscus, the structure connecting behind it is the posterior menisco femoral ligament and anterior, it is the anterior menisco femoral ligament. Commonly, the anterior menisco femoral ligament uh, is uh, uh, not present and uh, it, the posterior menisco femoral ligament will all, mostly it will be present. Posterior septum. The posterior septum is an extension of the posterior uh, synovium. It is a loose uh, structure which is filled with fat and connecting the posterior synovium to the PCL. In, it is filled up with fat and in the top of the posterior septum, the middle genicular artery enters and supplies the PCL. And in the bottom, in the near the tibial attachment, the popliteal vessels also there will be nearer. Uh, which are attached to the posterior tibia with the help of a fibrous band from the soleus. So the posterior septum is a very important structure whenever you are uh, releasing uh, or whenever you are doing the tibial resection, the posterior septum you have to release. This releasing of the posterior septum during PCL reconstruction will increase the volume in the posterior uh, 
space that will separate the neurovascular structures away from the joint, um, helping in the uh, easy passing of the guide pins and other structures. As I told you, the neurovascular structures are directly posterior and later to the arrangement of uh, PCL. Uh, this is a study where they have found out that uh, the posterior uh, neurovascular structures are only 2 mm away from the posterior tibial condyle at any degree of flexion, except in 100 degree of flexion, only in 40% chances they are little far, that is like around 10 mm. So uh, the drilling of tibia you should always do at 100 degrees of flexion. The blood supply of, neuro, of the PCL is made by the middle genicular artery and the nerve supply is done by the tibial and obturator nerves which forms a plexus and they enter in through the uh, septum to the uh, PCL. The biomechanics part, uh, the PCL is a main, uh, is there to stop the posterior translation. Secondarily, it helps in resisting varus, valgus and external rotation. The other uh, things which are there are as uh, PCL deficient knee is there, there are different problems can happen and different uh, uh, modalities we have to see and uh, to, to think whenever there is a PCL deficient knee like uh, uh, rotational or medial lateral stability, joint contact pressures, strength and proprioceptions, all these structures I will discuss in detail in the following slides. Whenever there is a PCL deficient knee, there is posterior shift of the tibia, which will posterior shift of the tibia, which will cause the femoral contact point to shift anteriorly. Whenever the Femoral contact point shifts anteriorly. There is increased contact pressure on the anterior tibial plateau, which will cause or which will cause more damage of the medial femoral condyle, as well as the medial meniscus posteriorly will become free. To maintain the joint, what happens is the uh, twisting or the rotation of the um, the medial uh, rotation of the femur will happen, and uh, the, the the rotation of the femur can cause damage to the anterior horn of lateral meniscus. The posterior tibial translation is minimal in between 0 to 25 degrees of uh, flexion. Whenever there is a tibial uh, flexion of 60 to 120 degrees, maximum tibial translation of PCL happened. The, this, is the way, this is why whenever you are checking uh, the PCL or uh, for any injury, you have to check in 60 to 120 degrees, especially like 90 to 100 degrees of flexion, where there will be 10 mm of uh, so 10 mm of translation. Many studies interpret that PCL as a main restraint for posterior tibial translation. Uh, if PCL is the main tibial uh, uh, tibial translation stopper, what about the popliteus? So there is a study where they have. There they have sectioned the PCL as well as the popliteus. So what happened? The tibial translation increased in all degrees of flexion. So that we can make a point that popliteus acts as a secondary stabilizer for posterior tibial translation, apart from maintaining the rotatory in, uh, stability of the knee joint. Now coming to the ro rotational and medial lateral stability only because of PCL. The rotational and medial lateral instability only because of PCL is still unclear. There are multiple studies going on because of the rotational and uh, medial lateral instability. The main study by Nielsen et al. They have mentioned where there is PCL sectioning, there is no rotatory or medial lateral instability only if there is a PCL deficient knee. But when they combine the PCL along with the lateral structural injuries or along with the lateral structural damage, there is rotational or medial lateral instability which appears now. So whenever there is a rotational instability in your examination, you have to see always doubt for PLC and lateral structure injuries. Now the reverse pivot shift, the same thing because the reverse pivot shift is also basing on the rotational and medial lateral instability. When there is only PCL uh, injury, there are less chances of reverse pivot shift. But if there is a PCL or popliteus or PCL or lateral structure injuries, the re reverse pivot shift will be positive on all the times. Menisco femoral ligaments, uh, there is a study by Strobe et al. where they have mentioned about the 
menisco fibril ligament uh, stability which is helpful for rotation or not so they have found out with or without pcl sectioning there is no uh, role of menisco femoral ligaments in the rotational instability the joint contact pressures uh, as everyone knows increases irrespective of only pcl or plc injuries uh, the medial compartment pressures increase by 52% after a, in a pcl deficiency and patellofemoral joint pressures are also increases by 40% well known fact that the joint pressure increases uh, by 40%. How this joint uh, contact pressures increases or patellofemoral joint pressure increases? Uh, this can be explained with this diagram where the patellar flexion angle increases. See, when there is a posterior translation of the tibia, the patella will rotate, the distal pole of the patella will rotate and come in contact with the intercondylar notch or the middle femoral condyle. So now what happens is the load extends or torque and the load to pull of quadriceps increases, which will cause a touching of both the patella as well as the femoral condyle causing the patellofemoral changes as well as the other joint changes and joint pressures. What about the morphological and meniscal uh, damages as well as chondral damages? There is a good study by Hamada et al. where they have mentioned or they have, they have examined 61 patients uh, with acute isolated PCL tears with grade 2 or higher. They have found out that 28% of the patients will have meniscal tears with a PCL deficient knee. And 52% of patients has chondral pathologies, most common in the medial femoral condyle. So you should be, uh, there should be a high index of suspicion for concomitant pathology whenever you are examining for PCL tears uh, for meniscal and chondral damages. The another study by Strobel et al. They have mentioned they have checked for the chondral damage after PCL deficiency with the help of arthroscopy. They have found out that 78% of patients exhibit lesions in the middle femoral condyle, same as I exam explained before by Hamid et al. And 47% exhibit chondral damage of the patella. And another study by Boynton et al. They have also mentioned 21% will need additional surgery for meniscus pathology after a PCL injury. Now, what are the effects of PCL deficiency on the other ligaments like ACL? The ACL also will get damaged slowly with the help of, uh, by, by in a PCL deficient knee. Like uh, there is a decrease in collagen fibrils in the ACL, decrease in the collagen fibril diameter, decrease in the collagen packing density as well. So isolated PCL deficiency causes other ligament damage also. Coming to the strength part, there are two landmark papers by Enoch et al. and Von Bont et al. Uh, published in 98 and 2005, where they have mentioned about the strength as well as the compensatory mechanisms in a PCL deficient knee. They have found out that there is a no difference in the strength of quads and hamstring after a PCL deficient knee, but gait adaptations do happen. What gait adaptations do happen, I will explain in the compensatory mechanisms. They have mentioned that return to sports depend upon the quadriceps strength and rehabilitation after the surgery. So after any sports injury, uh, any player after a sports injury with a good quadriceps strength and rehabilitation, they are able to play at a normal level, but subtle differences are there and adaptations uh, are also there, which can cause future problems. But after the um, PCL, with the PCL deficient knee, they are able to play for some time. The proprioception, as I was telling earlier, with the help of uh, uh, Pacini receptors, Golgi tendon receptors, uh, the PCL and ACL both play a crucial role in proprioception of the lower extremities. The proprioception also, there are two important studies by Clark et al. as well as Saffron et al. The Clark et al., they have mentioned, they have um, examined patients for seeing, perceiving the movement in a PCL deficient knee and threshold to perception of passive movements, both decreased in a PCL deficient knee, which gives a clear indication that proprioception will definitely decrease after a, in a PCL deficient knee after a PCL injury. Another uh, study by Saffron et al. They have mentioned that there are increased chances of degeneration of the joints in a PCL deficient knee, as well as threshold to detect passive motion 
and ability to reproduce passive motion also decreases this will give us to the point that whenever there is a pcl deficiency proprioception will decrease and degeneration changes occurs in the joint the compensatory mechanism the main compensatory mechanism in a pcl deficient knee is the gastrosoleus complex the as i was speaking earlier ino ketal and von bond et al in their paper they have mentioned that gastrosoleus complex activates earlier when in each velocity of flexion uh, in a pcl deficient but there is no difference in the quadriceps and hamstring activation but multiple papers are there in this uh, compensatory mechanism area where they are mentioning different uh, results or different outcomes some papers mentioned they have got uh, Uh, the quadriceps weakness is there after pcl injury or hamstring they, they have mentioned about the hamstring weakness but the only common point in all the things are compensatory mechanism is a gastrosoleus complex as i uh, leave this as a gray area i i think that most of uh, research is needed in this area for uh, in the biomechanics better understanding of biomechanics of the pcl injury so i would like to conclude my talk with a take home message that pcl is a largest intraarticular ligament always examine or operate uh, the tibial part of pcl in 100 degrees of flexion be careful of neurovascular structures while doing surgery for pcl the posterior translation of uh, tibia causes femoral contact force to shift anteriorly this causes damage to the lateral meniscus patello femoral angle increases always look for concomitant pathologies while examining or operating for pcl injuries strength and compensatory mechanisms of pcl deficient knee are a gray area which requires more research thank you uh thank you dr naresh it was a very uh, comprehensive uh, coverage of the complete anatomy and very pertinent to the arthroscopy part of it the surgical part of it i think we we will move on to the next lecture uh, which again is uh, very important because as orthopedic surgeons i always used to tell my residents when i was in medical college that you should always be able to read the mri don't just depend on the reports whatever the report says you must be able to verify it yourself because you 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 have seen the patient clinically so dr anupama patel will uh, give us an insight into the normal and abnormal uh, radiology of pcl ma'am uh, are you ready with your presentation Uh, ma'am you're not audible okay can you hear me uh, yes ma'am you're audible now thank you ma'am my screen screen yeah we can see your presentation uh, you just have to probably maximize it yes start yeah all right Yes ma'am thank you Okay Okay good evening everybody um i'm not very good at all this technical stuff okay so if i get stuck somewhere i'm going to ask dr biradas for his help All right so pcl normal and abnormal The MR protocol for PCL imaging is not very different from the MR protocol for any other kind of knee imaging. We take uh, sections in all three planes: sagittal, coronal, and axial. I have just highlighted this PD fat saturated and T two on my screen because both these are required: the fat saturated as well as the non fat saturated images. And I'll tell you why as we go ahead. and unlike in the acl pcl doesn't really require any oblique imaging whatever imaging we normally do is good enough so this is what the normal pcl will look like it's a uh, if you want to stretch your imagination it's an inverted hockey stick appearance is as how it is described in radiology um maximum dimension is usually about up to about 6 mm it's not usually thicker than that it is dark like this on all pulse sequences Now the interesting thing is, unlike with the ACL, you really PCL, um, it's just seen as one ligament. Whereas in the ACL, we are able to differentiate the two bundles. 
I'm going to speak a little bit about this menisco femoral ligaments because they are considered radiologically as a part of the PCL complex. Um, and I'll tell you why as we go along, because it, these are important structures when we look at PCL injuries. So the first, as discussed by the speaker ahead of me, was the ligament of Humphrey. This ligament is located anterior to the PCL. It courses across the joint space anterior to the PCL, whereas the ligament of Ristberg or the posterior meniscofemoral ligament, as shown with the arrows here, will extend posterior to the PCL. And I always tell our radiology residents and fellows to always identify these ligaments even in a normal scan, because it's only when you keep on identifying structures on a normal scan that you're able to then pick up the abnormal. Mechanism of injury has already been discussed. It's basically a blow to the anterior tibia. So whether it is a dashboard injury or it's a fall on a flexed knee, usually it is an anterior direct blow to the tibia. Now, this kind of a picture where you get a full thickness tear through the body of the PCL, as I've shown in these images here, this is not the usual way a PCL tear presents. Okay, and Again, unlike the ACL, which presents with like an out and out thickness tear through the middle body very often, PCL injuries rarely present like this. If they do, we're really lucky and they're easy to diagnose. Most of the times, this is what a PCL injury will look like. So these are the two factors that one has to remember uh, about diagnosing a PCL injury. One is that usually the maximum AP dimension of the PCL in a normal PCL is never more than about six millimeters. So once you start getting an AP dimension of more than six millimeters, that is considered abnormal. And as I showed you earlier, a normal PCL is jet black. It is not gray, it is not white, it is jet black. Look at the signal in both of these PCLs on either side of the normal PCL. There is some amount of hyperintense signal seen there on the T2 weighted images. So this combination of a thick AP dimension and intrasubstance signal, even in the presence of a continuous PCL, and even though the bony attachments are intact, Presence of these two structures indicates that this is a PCL injury. Okay, I've put these two images here. The difference between these two images is the image on the left is a fat saturated image. So if you look, you can see the bones, you can see the fluid, you can see the ligaments. You don't see any fat. Fat appears bright. It appears bright on both T1 and T2. So this image on the right side or on the left side of the screen the fat has not been saturated out, okay? Now, what is the difference between these two sequences? As you remember, I said earlier, we always do fat sat and non-fat sat both. Now, the difference is that on this fat sat image, I'm able to pick up the signals inside the ligament really, really well. So I know that there is bright signal, okay? But it is not so easy to see the margins of that ligament. If I have to measure exactly from anterior to posterior, it is sometimes difficult to get the exact anterior margin and the exact posterior margin because I have saturated all the fat which is around it out of the picture. Whereas if you look at the image on the left side, I can now clearly see the anterior margin. I can clearly see the posterior margin. And so it's much easier for me to make a accurate measurement. So like I said earlier, we have to identify these ligaments of Humphrey and ligaments of Risper. And the reason for that is, if you see this first image that PCL is intact, I see a nice ligament of Humphrey. Look what is happening to this image in the center. I see some signal inside the PCL, and that ligament of Humphrey is now sitting inside the PCL. The image on the left is the same thing, non-fat saturated, and I see that ligament of Humphrey, this black circular dot as shown by the arrow, actually sitting inside the ligament, right? Now, this is quite similar if you usually see shoulder MR scans when we see a subscapularis tear. The vertical segment of the long head of biceps actually goes into the subscapularis tendon. And that is one of the ways that we can tell confidently that there is a subscap tendon tear. Okay, this is a similar thing here. When there is a tear along the anterior margin of the PCL, that ligament of Humphrey sort of insinuates itself into the ligament and it is an ancillary sign that that ligament is injured. Similarly, with the ligament of Risberg, 
all of these images show you a thickened TCL, bright signal on T2. And if you look at the ligament of Risberg, it is sitting inside the PCL. It has no business to be sitting inside the PCL unless the PCL is injured. And this young person had actually both the ligaments as shown in the arrows sitting inside of the PCL. So there is a thick PCL, there is bright signal in the PCL, both the ligaments are inside the PCL. This is a PCL tear, even though the ligament looks continuous. Now, if we're lucky, not so lucky for the patient, but if we are lucky as radiologists, you see a bony avulsion, which is so clear. You know, you can just see that that bone has come off and the PCL is attached to it. And, you know, there is no problem at all about the diagnosis. The problem is that this diagnosis can even be made on an X-ray. So I don't need an MR to show me bony avulsion of the PCL. What I need the MRI for is for this. Not only am I able to identify the PCL attached to the fractured bone, I am now able to see the meniscal roots. Look at these coronal images. I wonder if I can get a pointer. Yeah. See, I have this big bone here. I see the root of the medial meniscus attached to the bone. And I see the root of the lateral meniscus also attached to the bone. So not only is there a PCL tear with a bony avulsion, but both posterior roots are also gone. Very rarely do you see a femoral avulsion. I saw one, so I've just put it into this. Okay. Now, associated bone contusions. Uh, the, um, in my earlier lectures, if any of you have heard me speak either on ACL tears or patellofemoral dislocations, you will know that the pattern of bone contusion contributes to the diagnosis. There is a certain pattern for ACL tears. There is a certain pattern for patellofemoral instability. Now, this is not so of PCL injuries. If at all you see a bone contusion, it's usually on the anterior tibia. That's because the direct blow is to the anterior tibia. Here's a patient who had a PCL tear. But look at the bone contusions in this patient. The bone contusions are on the lateral side, right? What does that tell me? It tells me that there is probably an MCL injury on the opposite side. So certain presence of certain types of bone contusions do help you to identify other ancillary injuries. As the speaker ahead of me just said, always look for the posterolateral corner. In this patient, there is a like a high-grade PCL tear. And if you look at the posterolateral corner, that is also injured. And obviously, this contributes to the instability. Look at all these four images. Now, in all four images, the PCL looks intact. Morphologically, it is intact. But take a look at this PCL. It's sort of wavy. Take a look at this PCL. PCL is quite all right. Maybe the margins are a little irregular. This PCL has some bone fragments in it. And this PCL is really, really thick here, inferiorly. Okay. All of these are nothing but chronic PCL injuries. So for this now, one has to know what the normal PCL looks like. Yes, it is black, but it is not as black as you see in these ligaments, because in these ligaments, some amount of fibrosis has occurred. So obviously, because fibrosis has occurred, the signals are really, really dark. Secondly, look at the margins of that PCL. In some of them, the thickness is a lot more. So it is not always possible to diagnose a chronic PCL tear on imaging unless you're really, really careful when looking at the images. And in fact, there are multiple papers that say that almost two thirds of chronic PCL injuries just don't get diagnosed because there is ligament discontinuity on the MRI. And that is not surprising because to start with, there is no full thickness tear. To start with, the ligament is conti contiguous even in the acute tear. As opposed to the ACL, where if there are intact fibers, it's an intact ACL. But intact fibers in the PCL do not mean that the knee PCL is intact. This was a this was actually a patient who was sent to me for a second opinion. 
he had on examination grade three PCL laxity, and this was a scan done on a one Tesla scanner, and somebody had reported a continuous or a contiguous PCL, probably normal, but clinically he had grade three. So sometimes three Tesla does help because if you look at these images now of the PCL, this PCL is very obviously abnormal. There is signal inside it. There is a wavy pattern to it. So even though it is morphologically continuous, it is still abnormal. But because MR evaluation, the sensitivity is not that good. How else do we diagnose these? So one is, of course, clinical examination. And the second is to look for the posterior translation. So one way to do it is on radiographs, on the kneeling radiographs, uh, lateral ones of the knee. The other way to do it is on MR, if you have done an MRI. And I'm just going to show you this case. It's a post-operative case, actually. He's had a PCL graft put four years ago, but he came with some amount of knee pain. Look at this PCL graft. It's thick, it's dark, but it's continuous. Now, who knows whether it's a functionally correct PCL graft or not. It is extremely difficult unless you examine for translation. So now we have actually we have this device, this uh, Porto knee testing device, which we've started using basically for the ACL to look for ACL, postro anterior translation and rotatory instability. And we've started experimenting with using it on the PCL as well to see whether we can identify translation of the tibia um, uh, dynamically on MRI. So the knee is placed in the device like this. It's an MR compatible device for ACL injuries what happens is this plunger that you see here is placed behind and pressure is exerted on the tibia from behind. And we look for the degree of translation, very similar to how you elicit it clinically. So for PCL, what we started doing is placing this anteriorly and actually trying to elicit the posterior translation. We're still in the process of getting enough images. And this is what we do. So we, we take that PCL and we measure in the neutral position and we apply AP pressure and look and see if there is any change in the translation. This was, um, again, a middle-aged gentleman who had a, undergone a PCLR, ACLR, PLCR, all of these things just six months ago. Again, came with some amount of pain in the knee. Now, anybody here would say, all right, thick PCL, though it's a PCL graft, thick PCL, some signal inside the graft. So are we looking at a good graft or is there some problem with the graft? Now, one thing you have to remember here is that six months back, this surgery was done six months back. So all of the signals that you see, whether in the knee or in the graft, are because of the surgery. Just like when we evaluate for meniscal tears or ACL graft injuries, one should wait at least one year before you comment on signals within and around the graft as being abnormal. Whenever we evaluate for either ACL grafts or PCL grafts, we always, always take CT images and we document the tunnels, the femoral and the tibial tunnel. This was a young patient who came with an ACL graft done some years ago and with some amount of knee pain. Now, I think we are yet to discuss the exact site of attachment of the graft, but as you see, this graft is attached very close to the articular margin. Um, I, I don't know whether that is appropriate or not, but this patient has done very well over the last years. His knee pain has nothing to do with his graft. As you see, his cartilage is good, his menisci are good. So, the cause of his knee pain is maybe because he has a high riding patella and that's the reason he has knee pain. As opposed to, and his bone tunnels are good as well. As opposed to that, we had this gentleman who had had, again, a PCL graft done some years ago and again came with knee pain. This graft also, the tibial tunnel is, I think, slightly high placed. Um, I'm not very good at deciding these things, but I think it's slightly high placed. Perhaps because of that, it's not been functioning very well. And now this patient has come back with all kinds of chondral injuries. 
there is an injury on the lateral side, look at the cartilage on the medial side, become thinned out, look at the cartilage in the patellofemoral compartment. And finally, I, just a brief word about this posterior tibial slope. Now, I don't do these measurements myself. I think the orthopedic surgeons do them. You guys do them yourselves um, in your clinics where you uh, take these two lines at five centimeters and 15 centimeters below the, tib below the tibial plateau. And you actually look for the angle. And um, there are some papers that say that uh, reduced posterior tibial slope uh, causes risk to PCL injury. Now, one of the ways to measure it is uh, on the x-rays. But if an MR has been done, uh, what we do is we measure the slope on the medial side and on the lateral side, and we average out the two and then uh, thing. But I, I don't know whether now this is a thing with your double bundle PCL reconstructions which have come up. So to conclude, what are the things we look for? Either a full thickness tear, which if you're lucky, we see a full thickness tear, there's no problem. If we don't, we look for the a maximum AP dimension. We look for the ligament of Humphrey and the Risberg and see whether they are becoming ensconced into the PCL. We look for bony avulsions. And when we have bony avulsions, we always, always look for the posterior root attachments. Always look for the posterolateral corner because that contributes significantly to the, to the instability. Chronic PCL tears, difficult to diagnose. Also, uh, see, one thing is if I have the earlier MR scan, then it's easy to sort of differentiate and, and compare the two and, and give a diagnosis. But otherwise, if you look at chronic PCL tears, you will not see the ligament so black anywhere. You may see some bone inside of it. You may see some irregularity. Always look out for all of these things. Evaluation of PCL grafts, like any other post-op scans, should not be undertaken as much as possible, at least one, one year after surgery. And if you do it one year after surgery, you have to be a little cautious when you look at the graft. If the graft is abnormal, you might end up with an osteoarthritic knee because chondral injuries are common if the PCL uh, injuries are not addressed correctly. And we have now started evaluating for translation using this Porto device. We are yet in the process of gathering all the information and coming up with a cutoff uh, figure. Hopefully that will happen sometime soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, that was a very elaborate and uh, very informative presentation for the radiology of PCL injuries. I hope, uh, Dr. Sandeep, sir, we'll take the question answers if there are any in the last only. You know, if... Yeah, sir, no problem. Or okay. uh, we can finish uh, radio question answers for the radiology now and then we can review them, ma'am. Uh, so I, I would like to ask if <laughs> panelists or uh, all the participants if they have any questions to ask. Uh, uh, from Dr. Anupama, ma'am, if there's anything you'd like to uh, like her to clarify or elaborate on. So, so nothing. Thank so you. I think <laughs> Thank uh, you. Uh, it was probably uh, that much clear that nobody had uh -huh. any doubt left in their minds. Uh, Dr. Yeah, I have one question, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yeah, ma'am, yeah, uh, ma uh, what, uh, what is the indication for repeat MRI, like as you mentioned a couple of times that uh, MRI needs to be done uh, never before one year. Mm -hmm. So like in case, so what could be the indication for repeat MRI if we have already operated patient with any knee surgery, whether it is ACL, PCL or multilingual? Actually, you know something, in whatever practice I have, the reason why people send for a repeat MRI are those patients that are chewing the orthopedic surgeon's brains. Ki, dukh rai, dukh rai, dukh rai, you know, something is wrong with my graft, something is wrong with my surgery. The only reason they come is so that they get relief, ki, uh, nothing is wrong, everything is fine. But otherwise, obviously, if you're looking for post-op infection, that would be a good reason to image again. Apart from that, honestly, re-tears and so on, I think in the first six to eight months are so uncommon. I don't think people go back to doing whatever they were doing till at least a year after surgery. So honestly, the main reason why people come for a post-op scan is because the patient is chewing the surgeon's brain. Uh, hi, Dr. Anupama, Dr. Tarun Desai. As you very well said, that till one year yeah. we can get the abnormal signals. 
So yes. till what time, you know, after how many years we can get a normal signal? Oh, people? you mean usually one to one and a half years in the PCL. Usually one to one and a half years, you will get a normal signal. Okay. Okay. But again, mm-hmm. again, if there is a little bit of bright signal in the PCL, it's mm-hmm. not abnormal. Okay. And and if you look at the T two, especially the T two, which is without fat suppression, do not saturate out the fats. Signals come back to normal pretty fast. Okay, thank you, Madam Doctor Sivin here. Hello. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Madam. Just one question regarding the PCL ablation. Uh, as yes. you correctly mentioned, you can diagnose it easily with the X-rays. So, yes. if it's small ablation, do we need to take go an MRI, or is it only for the large ablations that you suggest MRI? So, what happens is, I think when you have a small ablation. you still don't know if the roots are attached to that small avulsion so if you have a lot of instability clinically which is much more than what you would have with just pcl that's a good indication to do an mri also other injuries meniscal injuries any associated chondral injuries it's very hard to to find those injuries so basically correlate clinically and then order for them yes okay thank you uh, uh thank you thanks a lot ma'am i think uh, it was a great point because not only the pcl evolutions with the mri probably you can know about the concomitant injuries also That's how right. exactly you're going to deal with it mm-hmm. thank you ma'am thanks a lot uh, i think we should be ready with our next uh, presentation so after the anatomy and the radiology we move forward to the surgical part of it and uh, we have a presentation by dr sibin surendran regarding step by step pcl reconstructions dr sibin sir over to you thank you so is it visible yes sir hello uh, your your presentation is visible sir so good evening one and all first of all uh, thanks the indian arthroscopy society and uttaranchal orthopedic society for giving me this wonderful opportunity it's a real honor to be part of this academic initiative by the indian arthroscopy society so i bring greetings from calicut medical college which is in the southern part of india in kerala so without much delay i think go to the talk so i'll be taking you through the following steps to how to get these are the basic 10 steps to get success in a pcl surgery some of these may be the repetition of what already have heard about it but i think that's better for learning so start with anatomy any arthroscopic procedure you must know the anatomy and that was very well described by dr naresh as you see a compared to the acl the pcl as you see is attached to the anterior part of the middle femoral condyle the acl is completely attached to posterior part The ACL is behind the lateral bifurcate, lateral intercondylar ridge, whereas the PCL is anterior to the lateral intercondylar ridge. And out of the two bundles, in the A, it's the anterior lateral bundle that is the most strongest part of the ACL or the PCL, and that's what we are going to reconstruct rather than the posterior medial bundle in a single bundle. It's uh, second bundle uh, PCL reconstruction. And as you can see, uh, the on the femoral part, it is attached just adjacent to the cartilage. It's almost abutting the cartilage. So you must know this thing. uh when you are planning for reconstruction coming to the tibial side uh, the anterolateral and posterior medial bundle are named according to their attachments on the tibia that we have learned in the undergraduate days so the anterolateral bundle is attached this is the pcl facet it's on the anterolateral part up part of the uh, facet is the anterolateral bundle and the lower part is the posterior medial bundle and both are attached well below the tibial condyle as you can see this the anterolateral bun- bundle is anterior whereas the posterior medial bundle is posterior on the tibia and it's way extends way up to this is called the champagne drop that has been well described previously by the previous speaker so as you go and one important thing that's near to the pcl is the root of the medial meniscus and so that is very important that again was highlighted previously so when you are reconstructing if your the tibial footprint is way high you are likely to damage the medial root or the uh, short, uh, short white fibers of the medial meniscus a small video which shows the anatomy well this is the champagne drop off and here this is the anatomical landmark where your tibial tendon should be situated and these are two bundles and the meniscus femoral ligaments so that's the anterolateral bundle the where that's the thickest part and two meniscus femoral ligaments as you can see on extension the uh, posterior bundle posterior medial bundle is tight whereas on flexion it is the anterolateral bundle so and in flexion from 30 to 120 degree as was mentioned it is the anterolateral bundle that prevents posterior translation so the aim major uh, thing bundle that you need to reconstruct in a PCL surgery is the anterolateral bundle. So 
before you put the knife on the patient, always confirm the clinical findings. Why it's important? Because as was mentioned by Dr. the previous speaker, the MRI may show completely normal. Majority of our patients come late for the surgery. So, and when you take the MRI and if the radiology is not well versed with reading the musculoskeletal MRI, they may write as the MRI of the PCL is normal. So always, always have a good clinical examination. And more important for any arthroscopic procedure, it's better once the patient has been anesthetized, you do an examination of anesthesia. Compare with the opposite side before draping. That gives a lot more information than in than more than what you get in the clinics when the patient has got some pain and all those things. So compare the findings with the opposite side before draping. That will give you a whole lot of information, whether there are collateral injuries, whether there is a uh, whether there is any stress, valgus stress, virus stress, this is very well initiated under anesthesia. And especially in a grade three PCL cases, you have to rule out other collateral injuries, whether it may most commonly it's a post-lateral injury, but it can be post-remedial injury also. And before you begin the surgery, mark the distal pulse. It's a good habit to always check for the pulses in all your arthroscopic knees cases, knee or upper limb cases. So mark the distal pulse, especially for a PCL case. And if you have any doubt, you, have, you can use the CM for it's not the CM for this case. The, you can do a stress test, both medial lateral as well as anterior posterior under CM, and that will give further uh, strengthen your diagnosis of the PCL. So once you confirm the diagnosis, then you go for the setup. You can do PCL in either a hanging position or in the 90 degree, 90 degree position. The more important than that is that you should have a proper arm in, armamentarium. Armamentarium means you, apart from the PCL jig, you should have the elevator or the protective jig, and it's better you have some shoulder arthroscopy things like the Wiesinger rod, the cannulas, etc. and radio frequency. So these devices that makes your surgery very easy. And if you have the comfort of having a 70 degree scope, it's well and good. And arthroscopic pump is useful. But I rarely use arthroscopic pump. Usually the uh, elevation of this normal saline is better. So better to have some short arthroscopic instruments when you're planning for PCL. Coming to portals, the portals can, uh, usually in for PCL, we put both anterior and posterior portals. In the anterior, you have the classical anterolateral portal and anteromedial portal. What is the important point to highlight here is that the anterolateral portal and the anteromedial portal are very near to the patella tender because you want to go work inside the intercondylar notch. So, and usually the anteromedial portal is a higher portal than the anterolateral portal. Why? As you can see in this slide, if you are low, you will not see behind the tibia. Whereas if you are going up, you will see well behind the tibia. So, and your jig will be going easily to the posterior compartment. So you need a high anteromedial portal, a low and, and a normal anterolateral portal, as well as a low anterolateral portal for drilling the femoral portal, femoral uh, uh, footprint. Okay. So that's from the anterior part. Coming to the posterior part, as you can see here, you can put a both posteromedial and a postlateral portal, or some people do only with the posteromedial portal. So basically, what you want is that when you are putting a posteromedial portal, the knee should be in 90 degree flex so that it reduces it, it increases the capacity of the posterior compartment. And how do you put that? You put it under the guidance of the arthroscopic light, and it should be one centimeter, at least one centimeter above and behind the joint line. Okay, that's important because that's then only you can your instruments will reach up to the uh, up to the tibial footprint. Okay, so it should be above the and behind the femoral condyle, and and if possible, put a cannula that will make your work easy. Coming to the posterior portals, the posterior when you are planning for posterior portals, it's a good habit that you mark the common landmarks before you start the surgery. On the lateral side, you mark the, this is the lateral collateral ligament, and this is the bicep femoris tendon. Why is it important? Because your common parallel nerve is always behind the bicep femoris. So it's always better that you mark it before you start the surgery. And the soft spot for the lateral portal from the exterior is between the lateral collateral ligament, between the bicep, anterior to the bicep femoris tendon. Okay. So that's a soft spot, and that's where you plan for it. So mark it preoperatively before you begin the surgery. Similarly, on the middle side also, you mark it, the middle soft spot to, before, to get the middle soft spot. The middle soft spot lies between anterior to the middle head of gastronomus, above the semimembranosis tendon and behind the MCL. So that's the rough area. And sometimes when you're lucky in a thin patient, you can see the saphenous vein and the nerve. So try to avoid that when you're putting a needle uh, puncture for the posteromedial compartment. Okay. Sometimes you can put two, some of the people are doing uh, the PCL with two cannulas in the posteromedial compartment. Instead of putting one in the lateral, you can keep two on the middle side. That's personal choice. But what I commonly prefer is a posteromedial and postlateral portals. Now, a few words about the posterior portals from the surgical point of view. As you can see, the posteromedial compartment is well capacious compared to the posterolateral compartment. Okay, And these two compartments are separated by a septum, as was previously uh, highlighted by Dr. Naresh. 
and this septum is nothing but a synovial extension of the attaching into the PCL. So as you can see, the PCL and behind the PCL, the synovial septum extends up to the PCL and attaches to the capsule. Okay. So, and when you perforate, you can easily perforate, you can easily make a window in the septum and that make, gives communication of the postural lateral to the postural medial. So as I told you, the postural medial compartment is capacious. So you always keep the postural scope in the, usually it's better to keep the scope in the postural lateral compartment and do all the work, the working portal being postural medial because you have more space to manipulate your instruments. So that's a good thing when you're going for a posterior posterior triangulation, okay? So that's the window in the septum. The posterior part of the septum, as told was previously, it's a neurovascular bundle. If you go behind, and anteriorly is the PCL. So when you are going posterior approach, you can use two approaches to get to the posterior compartment. The one common one is the intercruciate approach that was popularized by Dr. Bancher. And the advantage of posterior approach is that you get good visualization of the typical footprint, as well as once you remove the septum, you get more space for working behind, and it re reduces the chances of neurovascular injury. So as I told previously, postal lateral portal is a usual viewing portal because of the narrow compartment, but as opposed to medial is the basic, is the larger compartment and it's usually the working portal. So that shows, this video shows the inter-compartmental approach, the inter-cruciate approach. So you go behind the two cruciates, can see a sagging ACL that's indicative of a PCL injury. You go decide, and it's better to use a radio frequency probe because it's basically mainly a fat tissue with some vascularity as was previously mentioned in the higher part you get vascular uh, branches of the middle geniculate artery so it's always better to use a uh, radio frequency probe and how much you will go posteriorly till you see the roof of the don't go till you see the roof of the nose don't go behind beyond this uh, body compartment then it is a risky area and till how much you uh, and uh, what is the end of your uh, dissection on either side till you, on either side if you uh, dissect you will get the postal medial window and postal lateral window this is, has been uh, no looks like a bad side as was called by dr bouncer and and once you have made the two windows you can pass instruments from the exterior compartment as i was telling you the medial to lateral you can communicate directly so that gives you a posterior to postal medial and postal lateral compartment compared to the reverse notch plasty the reverse notch plasty means you are doing small notch plasty in the lower half and you are going between the PCL and the middle femur, uh, middle femur condyle for the middle posterior middle portal. As you can see, I can little pie crust the MCL if it is too tight and you go behind in this portal, in this space between the PCL and the middle femur condyle. So that's the reverse notch passing approach to get directly into the posterior middle compartment. And then you can make, put the channel up there. So going to the next step, uh, before you start the surgery, you do a diagnostic scopy. Because many of the cases, as you can see here, the PCL appears normal inside. Understand? The fibers looks normal. Majority time, the PCL usually heals in continuity because of the good vascularity and the fibrosis. It usually heals in continuity. And on the femoral side, unlike an empty lateral wall sign that you see for ACL, you don't uh, rarely get an empty medial wall sign for PCL. It's usually the good PCL tissue is there. So PCL may appear normal. So what is the sign for your ACL, PCL injury? It's a pseudo laxity of the ACL. Otherwise called as a slopey ACL sign, as you can see here. The slopey ACL, sorry, slopey ACL sign, and that indicates that there is a PCL injury. And look for the medial lateral compartment for the drive-through sign that indicates whether there is a postal lateral or a collateral ligament injury. And in late cases, you will find chondroarthritic changes in the medial femoral compartment or the petal of joint. So there are various techniques for PCL reconstruction. Uh, it can be arthroscopic or open. The open is one commonly what is called as a TV inlay technique. That's not commonly done nowadays. Arthroscopic. Commonly done procedure is the arthroscopic transtibial single bundle ACL reconstruction. The rare, uh, the double bundle is not so common procedure. So because arthroscopy gives you a better exposure and you can preserve the PCL fibers that helps in proprioception and better healing. The graft option can be quads, BPTB, or uh, hamstrings. And one of the recent options are the peronis longus. I commonly use peronis longus commonly because you get a very good thick graft from the peronis longus. Coming to tibial tunnel. What you want in the tibial tunnel is you want to attach, you want to attach at the inferolateral aspect of the tibial footprint. As I told you, as you can see, the antro, it's, you are recreating the anterolateral part. So it's in the inferolateral part, just at the center to the champagne drop-off. Below the champagne drop-off is your popliteus fibers. So why you want to go low and lateral? Because you want to, that restores the anterolateral fibers and that reduces the killer turn effect. The killer turn, the sharp turn effect is reduced. You can reconfirm with your CM whether the pillar turn is, uh, whether the position is correct or not. So the far you low, 
uh, as far as you come into the posterior, uh, posterior part of the PCL facet, less chance of getting a keratin. And another thing to reduce the keratin is you increase the angle. From 45 degree to 65 degree, when you reduce the angle, increase the angle of the T-belt, you increase the chances of a sharp turn happening in the posterior aspect. Now, as you can see in the video, as I was previously mentioning, we are viewing through the posterior lateral portal and working the posterior medial portal. So you put, have, put a cannula and you come down, uh, come down, uh, come to the midline, and you are working behind the. This is the PCL stem, which is usually always present. How much you take out? You take out till you see the. Can see you can see the uh, popliteus fibers, the muscle fibers, and that's the point of attachment of your anterolateral bundle of PCL fibers. So you can see we have well maintained the PCL stem, the anterolateral fibers of the PCL. You introduce the PCL jig to the anteromedial compartment. Why anteromedial compartment? Then only will go into the anterolateral facet. If you try to introduce to the anterolateral compartment, you will not be able to attain the footprint on the anterolateral part. So in introduce through the anteromedial part of uh, anteromedial uh, portal, and you can drill under protection. You can use a protector, or you can use the same jig for protecting, as you can see here. And always the beauty of doing in the postlateral compartment, the postlateral viewing portal is that you can see the drill coming directly and avoid injury, avoid it going back. So you have better control over the drilling. And uh, once you drill, uh, re remove the uh, remove the sharp edges and with a shaver and an arrow, well, that will again reduce the chances of every graft abrasion and the killer turn. And finally, you pass the thread. You can pass a SS wire or sometimes a, a, a T bond, whatever it is, and take a, store it in the postal lateral compartment, postal medial part. Okay. And once the tibial cup, um, uh, the drill is over, it's good habit that you block the tibial portal. Otherwise, the blood fluid keeps on leaking and you will a lot of bubbles when you are do, going for the femoral side. And some people do femoral side first, that reduces that complication. So, but if you are doing tibial side first, uh, it's, it's better that you block the tibial tunnel from exterior. Coming to the femoral tunnel preparation, the femoral tunnel location is basically at the apex. As was previously mentioned, in the anatomy, it is between the trochlear point and the middle arch points. That is somewhere between one o'clock in the right knee and 11 o'clock in the left knee. And you can do make the femoral tunnel by two techniques. It can be an inside out technique or an outside eye. What we commonly do is an inside out. The what what you want for inside out technique is you insert the beep into the lower anterolateral. Tip. Then only you will get the correct higher point of at uh, higher point on the femoral side. And keep the knee around 100 degree flex and give a posterior push over the tibia. So that gives gives the better exposure of the middle femoral condyle. In the outside in technique, the main advantage is that you get a reduced critical angle. That's another angle. This is the killer turn, and this is another angle that's called as a critical corner angle, and that is reduced because you can't place the jig under your control, and you don't need much hyperflexion. So it's good for double bundle PCLs, but rarely used for single bundle PCLs. Now, this is the you mark the attachment. You don't remove the fibers. You mark the attachment of the anterolateral fibers. Then go to the middle port, anterior middle. The viewing portal is anterior middle, and you drill through the lower anterolateral portal. You put the bit pin. And it's good then the same diameter jig you can keep, the drill bit you can keep over that and then drill. That will give you a good idea of attachment and that will protect the other tissues. So that acts as a sleeve for your drill bit. How can you pass the graft? Again, there are two techniques. You can pass it either through the tibia, that's called as trans tibia. You start from the tibia, pull it out through the posterior and then come anterior. That's a commonly followed technique. Another one is a transportal technique. That means you pull the, put the graft through the anteromedial portal. You increase the size of the anteromedial portal and pull the tibial portion first into the tibia, lock it, and then pull the femoral portion. The advantage is that there is less chance of the graft abrasion from the killer turn. And how do you pass the graft? As I, told, as I already told you, uh, the graft is first passed into the, the, you make the loops continuous, take one loop through the posterior, posterior tibia and another loop through the femoral part, make it continuous, and then pull the graft either through the trans tibial way or transportal way. And this is a good trick that you keep a Swissinger rod in the posterior part over the, 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 over the uh, uh, pulling sutures of the graft. And that will give you a good liver effect and prevent the graft abrasion over the collector. Uh, and this is the view from the anterior. The graft is getting into the uh, femoral compartment, the femoral footprint, just adjacent, as you can see, it just adjacent to the cartilage. And it's in the high portion. So it's in around 11 o'clock or 1 o'clock position. And this is the final picture. Uh, once the PCL comes, the ACL gets tightened. Okay, so the slope PCL sign has vanished, and that shows that the PCL is reduced. The posterior tibial sac has been reduced. 
Now, how do you fix the graph? I don't go into the details of that. You can fix it inside the tunnel or outside the tunnel. It can be anatomic or extra anatomic. And on the table side also, it can be in the in the tunnel like an interphone screw or extra anatomic outside the screw, like with a endobotum or something. Basically, what one important thing that you have to keep in mind, you fix it in 70 to 80 degree of flexion. Unlike an ACL that you fix in 0 to 10 degree of flexion, here you fix it in 70 to 80 degree of flexion because that we, as we have already told you, the we are recreating the anterolateral bundle that is very taught in the flexion rather than extension. So keep the knee in flexion, neutral rotation, and look for the normal tibial step of around 10 millimeter that you want to recreate. Now, the new concept is you go for a hybrid fixation for ACL. That means that on the tibial side, along with the interference screw, you keep a suture disc, a screw with a uh, spiked washer, and it's better that you fix the tibial side on the posterior part of the aperture. Whereas similarly on the female side, along with the endo button, it's now some of the papers say that you can put an additional interference screw. The advantage of this hybrid position on both the sides is that it reduces the graft abrasion, reduces the movement of the graft in the tunnel, and it's better biomechanically and prevents graft elongation. So and definitely we are using commonly using hybrid position on the female side, but it's not so popular on the female side. And coming to the last, but not very, but very important, postoperatively, always, always check the distal pulses before you take the patient out. And always, uh, that's why I have told you to just mark it preoperatively so that you, it's easier to find postoperatively. And check for the SPO2 with the uh, SPO2 probe. Give a PCL brace rather than the normal ACL brace that you give. That has got a support on the calf. You can make a normal ACL brace with an additional uh, sponge or something like that in the calf area. And instead of normal closed chain exercises in the prone uh, supine position, ask go for the prone knee flexion in the And I think this will be highlighted in the rehabilitation part. But these are very important things from the post point of view. So to conclude, when do you get poor results of PCL reconstruction? Specifically, that when the graft is non anatomically placed, that can be easily reduced if you, have, if you learn about the posterior portals. When the graft is too thin, so minimum graft diameter that you need is around 9 millimeter. When the fixation is inadequate, so that's why, as I told you, we are going for more hybrid fixation, both on the femur and tibia, if possible. And always select your patient properly. That means the patient should not have, you should be correcting any malalignment like virus or valgus preoperatively if it is there. Any associated collateral ligament injury should be corrected for, along with that, rather than fixing only the PCL. And always, always, like any arthroscopic case, a good rehabilitation. 50% is surgery and 50% is rehabilitation. So surgery, rehabilitation plays an important role. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for the patient uh, Thanks a lot, Dr. Sibin, sir, for your uh, detailed presentation on this. Uh, what is, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, what is your uh, preferred graft choice for PCL reconstruction? Sir, um, well, previously I was commonly using hamstring, but majority, as uh, we know, the majority of the cases, great PCL will have collateral injuries, post-collateral or post or something like that. So the hamstring will be going for this reconstruction of the post-collateral. So what we commonly now your day use is the uh, Peroneus is longest. You triple the peroneus longest, that gives you a good adequate length, as well as diameter of around 9.5 to 10 easily. So, and there is no, not much comorbidity with the peroneus longest. So, with the peroneus longest, does your <coughs> yeah. post op rehabilitation change by any way? Do you, do you immobilize the ankle for some time, or is it the same as you did with hamstrings? No, sir, the post op doesn't change much. You don't immobilize the ankle. You just give a pressure bandage for a few days till the uh, reduce any hematoma, otherwise the rehabilitation remains the same, same part as the normal PCL. We are Sir, also doing perineus longus here and this is a very good graph. We get a 28 to 30 centimeters of graft and we can easily triple it. Yeah. So right. good graph in our scenario, I when you have multiple ligament cases. I just want to ask, what is the specific indic indication for using the posterolateral compartment for PCL reconstruction, it's opening the septum. I mean to say, is there any uh, specific sir, indication to use sir. the posterolateral vision portal? And no, sir, the there's no specific indication. It just makes your life comfortable if you are you okay with it. The, the main advantage is that when you are viewing from the posterolateral, you can see the posterior part of the PCL. Your the femoral the tibial tunnel comes on the infralateral part of the PCL footprint. And that's easily visualized if you are visualizing the post lateral and working through the post middle. It's a personal choice. There is no specific indication. Yes. Okay. okay. Doctor, uh, Doctor Sibin, uh, small yes, questions. Uh, one uh, yes, in this, uh, you said regarding a seventy degree scope. Yeah. Uh, do you try to avoid a, a second posterior portal using a seventy degree scope? 
so, uh, the advantage of 70 degree soap is that they people say that you can visualize from the anterior without any putting any posterior portal. I have not, I never tried that. I didn't have that experience. It's just uh, people are saying I have heard it that I have never tried that. Okay. And other thing is ki, uh, regarding that hybrid fixation, I totally agree with that. So uh, do you try doing an all inside PCL, loading the graph from the AM portal and doing an all inside PCL? That gives a better, easy way to doing an hybrid fixation. Any experiences with that? No, sir. I don't have any experience with that. No experience. But I think both are, it's a good approach. Uh, it's a good suspensory fiction. Hopefully it should be good. There are many papers which say that the all inside PCL does well because you don't need a long graph and uh, and the results are good. The papers say that I don't have personal experience with the all inside PCL. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Aditya, this side. Just wanted to know anything you do to negotiate the killer turn, whether you cure it, whether you smoothen it out a little bit. Yes, that's an important thing. Important. One thing is, as I told you, your footprint should be inferolateral at the footprint on the tibia. So that increases the, that means you are in the posterior, lower half of the posterior facet. So that distance increases. Second thing, you yes, cure sir. it out the upper edge. The shaver with the shaver mm. or the rasp, you can cure it out the smooth on the upper edge of the tibial footprint. So that the, when it turns, the graph doesn't get separated. And, and third thing, you can use a good angle for the tibia. Instead of 40 or 50 degree, make it 60 or 70, 65 degree. Because 65 so that, degree. Uh, uh, 65, so that, that angle gets increased. Instead of an acute angle, you get a more obtuse angle. So that reduces the killer turn. So these are the main things. Oh. Okay. Uh, good evening, Dr. Savit. Dr. Pravnish, yes. aside. Uh, yes. Regarding uh, about 70 degree scope, uh, yes. I think uh, using it or not using it, either you want to make you want to use posterior modal portal or don't want to make it depends on your training how you have been yeah, training. Yeah, yeah. I agree. In our I agree. center we are using only 30 degree scope and i have not i don't use any posterior medial portal and i find only using from anterior medial portal and high and low both i don't use the anterior medial portal using only 30 degree scope definitely 70 degree scope makes your life comfortable definitely yeah, yeah. Yeah, it depends on the training and majority of us are doing only with 30 degree scope. So we don't have the luxury of using 70 degree scope at every place. So it's better to learn with 30 degree. You can always add 70 degree to your armament. Uh, there's only one thing I would like to add, uh, Dr. Pavnish. If you're not using the posterior medial or the posterior lateral portal, I think I'm very sure you must be using the C arm probably to check for your TBL tunnel, right? Uh, no, or sir. do you use the posterior medial safety incision for that? Nothing, sir. Yeah. I have been trained like this, so I feel more comfortable. But how do you know whether whether the pin has crossed the tibial cortex or not? How do you check for that? It's uh, when you make if anterolateral portal too high, I made too high anterolateral portal, and okay, it, okay, it negotiated, it reaches to posteriorly. It's okay, so you mean you visualize through the anterior portal? Anterolateral so portal. It, it's a it's a bit difficult sometimes because yeah. uh, when you come down a little proximally, which is the right uh, the point to come out, sometimes it's difficult. But of course, if you're trained like that and you're happy doing it that way, I think that makes we sense. We can surely visualize, but how do you stop the drills and the remers from getting into the neurovascular structures without it's, it's, it's placing it's it? Visible. I told you, it depends on your training. I have seen my boss doing like this and I find it very comfortable. It depends on training. It's nothing. I am doing something extra. It's all depends on training. Because I have uh, been trained. He, he says he watches it. He watches it from the interior, interior portal only. Anterior, high to, anterior portal. Yeah. So it's not like he is doing it blind. He's doing it mm. under visualization only. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How do you manage all anterior, visualizing anteriorly, working from anteriorly? How you reach below the slope, down the slope? Is what yeah. kind of instrument you use to clear the tissue? Because how can you visualize the pin down? You can visualize the pin, but how can you reach? You can visualize down, but how you reach down means to clear the tissue, to see the tip of the guide wire. Uh, from, uh, I, make, I make anterior medial, high portal, anterior lateral, both high portal. I use two portal medially, two portal literally. Maybe and maybe we'll we'll have another presentation by Dr. Pavnish <laughs> with some videos. Yes, yes. Next time yeah, with yeah. videos, next so time. We'll, definitely. we'll probably move forward to our uh, next talk. Uh, coming down from PCL reconstructions, uh, we move on to PCL evolutions. Again, a very important topic. Again, commonly missed. Uh, Dr. Shripa Joshi uh, will be presenting this. Sir, are you ready with your presentation?
yes sir yes sir over to you sir thank you yes sir yes sir Meanwhile, you open. I am not able to share it. Wait a minute. Oh, what is the problem, Doctor? Sir, yeah, please help me. Wait a minute. First, open your presentation. Meanwhile, I am asking one question to uh, Sibin, sir. Yeah, please. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sibin, sir. Uh, if you, if, uh, if you, if you are uh, fixing femoral uh, side of ACL outside in, what kind of uh, changes in your fixation? method are you using hybrid or only outside uh, no, if you are planning for outside in then the only option you have is the interfer interference screw otherwise or a screw with the post and the washer a screw post but that's not rarely done mainly thing is interference screw you can't use an endo button when you are doing an outside in technique is okay. there any difference in strength <laughs> in graph if we are using outside in or inside out there is no difference in the outcomes both are same there's no so if you are on hybrid from outside in technique, then you put an interference screw and then you tie the sutures over a, a screw or a post something on the femur. Then it becomes hybrid. Okay. So basically you increase the strength of fixation on both tibia and femur. That's the main thing. Okay. But you can't use endo button in an outside in technique. That's the main take home. Any, any take for the... Yeah. Yeah. Is it ready, sir? No, sorry. It's not happening. What is the... Can we uh, have the last presentation? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I will try. Yeah. yeah. So I think Dr. Ashutosh, uh, if your presentation yeah, yeah. is ready, sir, we can. Uh, yeah, yeah. Should I say? Yeah, we can do the rehabilitation first, then the PCL yeah. level. Yes, I am ready. I am ready. Yes. Is it? I'm. My skin. Uh, okay. Well, okay, sir. Can you yes, see yeah, my yeah, skin? Okay. Okay. Go to go. Go to go. Right. Right, so, sir. Visible. So, uh, this is how I do. Uh, I will start now. Yes, sir, please. Uh, I yeah, think okay. you will have to maximize your screen and slide yeah. show, please. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So, myself, Dr. Zoshi, I am from Aurangabad. I am working at uh, MGM Medical College as associate professor. We have seen a lot of uh, PCL avulsion cases in our day to day practice, and sometimes we miss if we do not take the proper lateral x ray. Uh, so, this is the classification we are calling like type 1, just uh, undisplaced type 2. Is the, uh, Dr. Shripad, it's not progressing. Not progressing. Sir, you have to probably uh, click on the from current slide or. No, it's a current slide only. No, no. Uh, the, yeah. uh, just on the top the left. Sorry, uh, not... unshare the screen and uh, unshare this and then again start sharing with your uh, desktop, not PowerPoint. Share the desktop. Okay. And don't close the PowerPoint. Let the PowerPoint be open. No, I'm not understanding why it's not happening. <laughs> So can you ask next presenter to present because yeah. this is not happening. I don't understand what is happening. Uh, no, no worries, sir. I, I think we can have the last presentation okay, rehabilitation sure. uh, by Dr. Ashish. Yeah. Should I share? Yeah. You, yes, sir. You can start, sir. Thank yeah. you.
it's visible yeah it's visible sir yeah Re- should i start yes you can sir yeah thank you rehabilitation after peaceful reconstruction or repair now the first is rehabilitation protocol for peaceful reconstruction uh, all these figures is covered i think uh, everything we just just have to tell the re- uh, what is rehabilitation the phase 1 from 0 to 4 weeks after surgery or goal is to protect the graft reduce swelling minimize pain restore patellar mobility restore full extension gradually improve flexion and reestablish cord control and regain full active extension now weight bearing partial weight bearing with crutches with brace lock and extension with all emulation and sleeping precaution avoid hyperextension activities and prevent posterior tibial translation we have to go intervene if there is swelling we have to put a ice pack compression elevation we have to see for range of motion and mobility we got for patellar mobilization supine inferior and medial lateral seated active assisted knee flexion quadriceps sets and slr what's the criteria to progress a good quadriceps control no lack with slr full knee extension more than suggestive flexion no sign of active inflammation of phase 2 it's 4 to 12 weeks after surgery goal is but increase knee range of motion partly flexion normalize gait improve quadriceps strength and hamstring flexibility weight bearing during this phase the brace is progressively unlocked when able to perform slr and weight bearing is increased at uh, two months brace is discontinued patient may discontinue crutches if they demonstrate the following no quadriceps lack with slr full knee extension knee range of motion till 90 to 100 and normal gait pattern precaution avoid hyperextension activities prevent posterior tibial translation then for 4 uh, to 8 weeks we can add wall slide 0 to 45 degree of knee flexion and leg press 0 to 60 degree of knee flexion then to 2 to 3 months we can start a stationary bike gait training over level ground mini squats and leg press now the criteria progress is no fusion no swelling pain after exercise it should be normal gait near normal gait and range of motion equal to contralateral side by 3 months on the phase 3 is 3 to 6 months after surgery goal is the safety progress strengthening we have to for intervention strengthening sizes like leg press machine hip abductors and adductor machine we can go for treadmill walking jog in pool with belts and swimming but no breast too criteria to progress is full pain free range of motion muscle strength and proprioception now the phase 4 6 to 9 months after surgery goal is safe and gradual turn to walk and safely initiate sports surgery training program for intervention intervention like running to running programs progress is jogging running program without pain without effusion and without swelling now coming to rehabilitation program protocol for tcl repair in this the weight bearing as so tolerated with crutches range of motion will be blocked from 0 to 20 degree in base for 4 weeks not to push for extension past due degree for 6 to 8 weeks post shop to protect capsular repair no restricted knee flexion sizes for 6 to 8 week post op regular manual and self mobilization of patella to prevent fibrosis a week one pain and edema control ankle pump cords leg raise mild asymmetric restricted knee extension two to four weeks progress weight bearing and functional mobility passive extension stretching to 0 degree only to protect capsular repair cords glutei abductor rectus isometric within the range of restriction knee bending 0 to 20 degree ankle exercises and patella supra patella pouch is car mobilization regularly now going to 4 to 6 weeks braces for 0 to 70 degree for day to day activities and exercises cords and knee extension isometric through multiple range prone hip extension exercises in extension only bicycle for range of motion only and without resistance then we 6 to 8 weeks increase in your motion to full in brace and we know when range of motion is 0 to 120 degree 
can you increase intensity and resistance of the exercises? Goal is to increase passive and functional range of motion. Two to three months, undo with all exercises, add little exercises, begin hamstring flexion exercises against light resistance, functional pistol brace to be used with sporting activities, increase resistance of cycling, stair machine, and pool program. Three to four months, goal are to increase strength, power, and cardiovascular conditioning, sport specific exercises and training program and light running. Four to six months, goal is to develop maximum strength and power and do advanced to sporting activities, restrict close chain rehabilitation and running program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was uh, really crisp and to the point presentation regarding the post-op protocol. Uh, sir, Dr. Shripat, sir, are we ready with the presentation now? Sir, in the meantime, a question to Ashutosh, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, when in reconstructions, when is the time you usually start the peak performance exercises and what is the, like, uh, any clinical symptoms or signs you see before doing that? See, first thing, yeah, uh, uh, we, we, we go for uh, uh, we put a brace for at least for six to uh, six to eight weeks, and we we uh, we know the brace when you uh, you achieve the range of motion till zero to one twenty degree, and you start running or sport activities only after four to six months. Okay. Am I visible now? Uh, so the slides are visible, but probably you'll have to uh, initiate the start the slide show. Yes, yes, yes. Is it okay now? No. Not yet coming full screen. Or you can exit from the slide show and uh, move the slides from this view only. If but, it is not coming. Oh, then... Am I? Is it visible? No. The, the slide show screen is not visible. It's showing you a presentation view. The normal view. So you can click on any of the slides, I think, and then we can always continue with the same view. Yes, maybe. On the left side where the slide sorter is, yeah. So you can just yes, that way we can probably no, proceed. It is not happening, so I will present like this only. Sorry. Right, sir. No, no worries. Thank you. So most of the uh, most of the time we see the PCL version and a uh, lot of the cases we come across to see the PCL, PCL version and it's very much important to address it properly. So uh, the conventional classification we are following like type 1, undisplaced type 2, anterior part displaced and posteriorly it is still intact. In type 3, completely displaced. So what actually it's uh, incidence around 3 to 38 percent of the acute knee injuries we see the PCL fracture, the PCL avulsion fractures. Early fixation, early identification, proper treatment is most important for a union and, and to improve the stability. Now this is the grading of a PCL avulsion injury. Uh, how much is the translation, posterior translation or posterior sac? from the original 10 mm anterior position of the medial tibial plateau in relation to the femoral condyle. We grade it as 0 to 5 mm, grade 1, grade 2, 5 to 10 mm, grade 3 more than 10. So this is a like conventional treatment of the PCL tier. Large uh, giving the stability, they do the open reduction internal fixation and small fragments is that translation uh, means uh, that is a conventional thing like uh, posterior tibial translation less than 5 mm, cardiac rehabilitation, conservative treatment, posterior tibial translation more than 5 to 10 millimeter. We, if not amenable for fixation, go for reconstruction. So, like conservative management, like uh, active activity modification, cardiac rehabilitation, functional bracing, we can do that. So now how I uh, operate and how I address the PCL avulsion injury. Basically, I do arthroscopic suture bridge technique and I use two tunnel, uh, two techniques like single tunnel technique and two tunnel technique. For larger fragment, I use two tunnel technique and small fragment, I use single tunnel technique. 
so this is a few uh, case so this is the patient you can see this is a pre op video on uh, table there is a sac posterior draw test positive gross posterior draw test positive so this is the setup this is the position iucm and uh, hanging position classic hanging position for pcl so this is like intra op imaging we use we use the pcl for the making tunnels so this is the visualization from the anteromedial portal you can see that i have elevated the pcl bowel fragment with the rf probe this is the fracture crater we are visualizing visualizing from the posterior portal and i have i have cleared the space uh, below space on the crater so now this is the next step i use two fiber wires uh, number two two fiber wires which i shuttled from the anterolateral portal by making the space between the acl and pcl by clearing the space tissue behind the pcl between the acl and pcl and passing the fiber wires and looping around the pcl and taking the fiber wires from the post uh, bring it back to the from the posteromedial portal and then i use the cannula in the posteromedial portal and then i uh, use the sliding knot i tie the knot i use the sliding knot and two half inches for the sliding knot i don't completely tie the completely compress the knot against the pcl i keep a bit loose uh, on the posterior part so that i can and manipulate that knot around the pcl on the back side and put that knot on the uh, owl's fragment so this is next step now the the tunnel which is more on the lateral side towards the uh, posterior lateral side this is the one tunnel then this is the uh, this is the uh, extra on uh, outer school outside view you can see the scope is inside the posteromedial portal and you can see the two guide wires which i have used to make the tunnel this is the missing the rod which uh, is helpful to manipulate the uh, pcl fragment to assess your knot to see the space if you are not able to see it properly you can manipulate with the help of missing the rod now you can see these are the two tunnels you can see the guide wires one in the lateral side and one towards the medial side so this is the final picture you can see that pcl fragment has been compressed uh, very nice neatly over the crater and i bring that fiber wire to the tunnel shuttle it uh, on the anteromedial aspect so in this case i have used the fixation uh, window fixation means as there is a uh, bony bridge between the two tunnels i use that bone uh, for tying the knots and compressing the pcl owl fragment so i manipulate the knot so that knot can be properly fixed uh, place over the pcl uh, fragment posterior side so you can see this is immediate uh, immediate after the uh, pcl avulsion fragment session you can uh, significantly appreciate that the pcl sag is gone and the posterior draw test is absolutely negative another way of doing it now you can see this is a pre op image uh, pre op owl's pcl fragment going up posteriorly so now i am using that pcl fragment basically this was a uh, uh, 14 year old kid and i have uh, tried to go below the physis so i have drilled the tunnel this is single tunnel which i have drilled it is a pcl uh, physis sparing tunnel basically so now you can see i have used the endo button to tie it as i have used the single tunnel you can see the pcl owl fragment nicely compressed over the crater so this is a paper which suggests that the single tunnel technique is you can use single tunnel technique suture bridge technique to fix it so this is another case this was the lady it this was a 18 year old male patient with pcl owl gen with posterior or grade 3 positive so we have done it we have fixed it you can see that pcl fragment is compressed nicely we have tied the knot anteriorly over the end endo button so this is a short video you can see so this is uh, we are visualizing it for the posteriorly posteromedial fragment i have drilled the tunnel single tunnel i have shuttled the wire through, through the posteromedial uh, tunnel so these are the fiber wires which i have taken the knot on the posterior aspect of the pcl avulsion 
I am trying to manipulate that not over the uh, PCL owls fragment. So I uh, you put the instrument through the septum between the PCL and ACL and try to reduce the uh, PCL owls and fragment. So this is uh, most of the time we have a problem that knots get slided medially. So we need to manipulate that knot a bit laterally. This is how now this is well fixed. We see a knot and this is the final fixation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I thanks a lot. I have a thanks question. a lot, sir. Any, yeah, yeah, any questions? Uh, 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 I, I, I want to ask uh, whether you take the knot the the fiber wire through the substance or or do you encircle the pcl no i encircle i uh, loop around the pcl okay. so i loop around the pcl so you have two limbs we bring that two limbs posteriorly through the cannula so, in the posteromedial tunnel when, I the, the, when the bony fragments are small are, are you not worried that the the, the loop might get slipped yes yeah, that's what i'm saying that is what we have to manipulate the fragment. We have to manipulate that knot so that it could be uh, seated over the posterior surface of the fragment. So we have to manipulate it from the two ways, like from the uh, anterolateral portal as well as anteromedial portal. And we, uh, with that both instrument, we have to do some jugglery to place that knot properly over the PC level fragment. Okay, so when you tighten it onto the tibial end, the through the also. Sorry, we are, there is some, uh, there is some confusion. Okay. Yes, I am not audible. I am not audible actually. Uh, you are not audible. Sorry. I am not able to hear the question. Yes, Dr. Meena. Yes, you can speak. Then I, I was asking why not take the sutures through the substance? No, because if you take to the substance, you will be not able to hold entire PCL, one thing. And another thing that you may come in the middle of the PCL sometimes if you take through the uh, PCL substance. So it is far better to not be the PCL and, and circulate around the PCL so that you can exactly, it will help you to manipulate, it will help you to manipulate the fragment. But if you break through the substance, it will be more difficult. You may evert the fragment. It will not exactly fit over the crater. There are high chance you may use the fragment. So it is better not to take through the substance. I have a question, Dr. Joshi, sir. Uh, when you fix this, uh, the fiber wire or the fiber tape anteriorly, do you take any position of the knee when you tighten it anteriorly? No, no, no. I don't like uh, conventionally when we are doing reconstruction, we do the uh, anterior drawer test to the mm -hmm. PBR. Mm -hmm. I don't do that because if my uh, fragment is sitting it properly, and I am pulling it, it's itself it gives the entry drawer. Means the pulling okay. force gives the entry drawer. So we need to uh, stabilize the reduction and then we need to uh, tighten the knot. And your post op protocol is same as for the PCL? Yes, same as PCL. I use PCL brace so that it will support it. And then, for, uh, and then four weeks after that, I start the rehabilitation, not immediate after four, uh, after uh, PCL oxygen fixation. Okay. Thank so I, I think we had a very long and uh, very very. I have a, I have an, a, another question. I think we will take the last. Can I ask question one more question? We wind up. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, till what time will you prefer Arthur? I do it uh, seven to ten days after the injury, depending upon if it is isolated PCL aversion. If it is a gross PCL aversion fixation. If there is a multiple injuries, I avoid to do it. If it is a single PCL avulsion with some meniscus, I have managed some patient with PCL avulsion and uh, root of the meniscus. We can easily fix it. But if it is attached to no, the bone, it, it will itself. To ask, if, it, if, if, if it gets old, how many, uh, how, uh, if it gets how old, you are then it will not get. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. How yes, old yes. you are asking? Yes. So actually, I have done uh, up to 60 days. After the injury, I have done the PCL allergen fixation. We need to just roughen that uh, fragment properly. You have to clear the yes. fragment from the both crater side as well as fragment side. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you
I think uh, uh, Dr. Puneet sir, uh, uh, I would I would uh, give over to Dr. Puneet Agarwal sir for giving the vote of thanks. I'd like to thank all the panelists and uh, all the speakers for a very very nice, informative and uh, thought provoking discussions today. Puneet and sir, Dr. Can I have a small question to Dr. Ashutosh? Uh, is he there? Dr. Ashutosh Agarwal sir, are you there? I just I want to find a specific company from which he is using a PCL functional brace. I think he is not there. I think it's better to, you know, like we are already doing, no, just put a, put up a cotton roll or something which probably pushes the TV up. Uh, no, I'm asking I, I, about the range of motion brace, not the static one. The range of motion specific brace, like the DGO company is having, but that's very costly. Very costly, I know. Uh, I know. Even the abduction braces are they they're very costly. True, 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 true. true. So Puneet sir, uh, vote of thanks and uh, over to you. Okay. Okay. Dr. S uh, Sandeep sir. Hello. Dr. Sandeep sir, are you here? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I'm here. Is, is there any document? Uh, you you uh, write down one, the case-based discussion. Is there anything left? Uh, no, no, no. I think we are done. We are done. Okay. Yeah. So... So thank you, sir. Thank you, our or uh, all our speakers, Dr. Nareshar, Dr. Anupama, ma'am, Dr. Savin, sir, Dr. Shripa Joshi, sir, Dr. Ashutosh Agarwal, sir. Thanks on behalf of Uttaranchal Orthopedic Association for this nice webinar. Thank you, Indian Arthroscopy Society. Thank you, Sandeep, sir. Thanks a lot for organizing this. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, our uh, panelists. Thanks, our delegates. Thanks to all. Thanks to our media partner. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, Romesh, for a nice moderator. Good night. Thank you, boss. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sandeep, sir. We will meet Thank again. So we will plan yes, our other webinar, too. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank we, should, you. we should be moving to physical meetings now, sure. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> right, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye, Adul, sir.